This year has been an incredibly exciting year for cameras, to say the least. And something that I've loved about camera launches this year is gone are the days where there's a spec sheet and a 3D render of a camera floating, where I would have to wait months to figure out, like, is this a camera for me? Because this year has been one marked by the fact that the launch videos themselves are videos with creators like me with the cameras in their hand and in scenarios that I recognize that are very similar to what I've been asked to create in the past. And it really played with the idea for me, the idea that cameras are platforms. Cameras aren't these, these perfect objects that when they get launched, that's how they stay forever and that's how they're gonna be used in the wild. Some are and some scenarios do call for it, but more often than not, when we get specific requests from clients, when we have restrictions shooting on set with the number of crew that we can have on set, we rig our cameras in very specific ways that help us achieve the shots that we need to get on the day. And some of those rigs are the only way that we can get those shots on the day, especially when we work in a crew of one or two people. So today I'm going to play around with those rigs. I'm going to harken back to my childhood playing with Lego and we're going to put some rigs up in front of you that are indicative of the things that we've created in the past and the things that really helped us get some of the magical shots that take that perfect body, that 3D render that you see on announcement day and turn your camera, your platform into a tool that will allow you to get any shot you're asked to get in whatever scenario. An important starting point is of course your camera. What camera are you using on the day? And something that I love about these Sony cameras and something that was incredibly formative for me in my first days of creating is the base of the camera. The camera in its purest form, it's tiny. It's a very small device that means that wherever you end up, however complicated your rig is or however small your rig is at the end of the day, your package is going to be a lot smaller than a traditional cinema camera or a shoulder mounted pro camera. And that's something that really has helped me as an individual creator, someone who's just got a backpack or one extra hand on set, really push what those numbers and those resources can create at the end of the day. You can have a single body with a tiny lens on it, or you can go up to a bit more of a beefy lens. This is my favorite lens at the moment. But at the end of the day, your starting point, the camera looking into its soul, it's a tiny thing that, that will really enable you as a small team to create more. Probably the base, the starting point of all of our rigs is something called a camera cage. A camera cage is what turns your camera, it takes those specs, that processing power, and adds that Lego element to it. The first setup or rig we're gonna talk about is how we rig our Sony cameras in a cage right? How we put our full frame cams in cages that enable us to put whatever accessories we want, whatever additions, and really turn that single body into the center of a larger production where you can rig wireless HDMI on there, right? You take your handheld camera into a platform that client can see, that the director can see. You're a cinematographer out in the wild. We've done some incredible shoots where we've had multiple guys out in separate parts of a scene, right? And you're able to centralize and view through that camera lens, no matter where you yourself are placed. It also means that if you have to squeeze your cameraman or your cinematographer or yourself into a very specific space, that's not restricted by client or the director needing to be able to see over your shoulder when you're getting that shot, right? It gives everybody on set that safety to know what's going on. And it's also wireless HDMI on a small camera. You'd think, I'm a lone shooter, I don't necessarily need that. It's an incredible tool for cost as well, right? If you've got a larger team, if you're a one-man band shooting, I've been able to coordinate like three cast members 
by the mere fact that they can, wherever they're walking from, wherever they're performing from, if I'm remote to that, they can see what I'm shooting. And it's an incredible tool to have a dialogue between you as the creator and everybody around you, whether it's crew team or whether it's the cast. A great thing that we've done, putting things on a cage, is how audio has changed over the years, right? A cage enabled us to have multiple accessories, including a microphone, but now in our current workflow, we're able to have wireless HDMI, an external monitor, and a wireless microphone on that cage, right? Where you can be monitoring cast, where they're sitting remotely from you, whether you need to hide the microphone on the cast, you've got your lav mic monitoring. In my mind, it's really a replacement or it's in place of like a desk of production, right? And when I think of working on a larger commercial set, I can see the roles that I'm supplanting as I add accessory by accessory onto the cage. And I can see I've got VT on the cage as I put a wireless monitor on. I've got sound on the cage as I put a wireless microphone on. Now the great thing about a camera cage is it can be as complicated and as simple as you want it to be. If you're on a larger production, especially a multi-day shoot, something that we've done quite often, you can leave that cage rigged so that the camera lives how you need it to over the next 21 days. Or you can strip that down and I've left my camera in a cage when it's just me on holiday, right? And that might seem weird, but there are some very specific ergonomic changes that a cage makes, right? Firstly, it's that idea of augmenting you as a one-man band, right? Easily throw a monitor on there, easily throw a microphone on there. But a great secret for having a cage on your camera is that the extra weight, it seems counterintuitive, but the extra weight actually improves the handheld handling of, of the camera itself, right? It enables you to get those pans, those tilts, those pushes in handheld much easier because the inertial mass of the camera is a lot higher. Something that we rarely benefit from is that you have these Sony APS-C cameras. You've got the 6300s, the 6500s of the world, right? And they're light, they're compact, and you can put them in your jacket pocket. But when I'm creating video with them, sometimes it helps to actually add some extra weight so that it feels a bit more weighty in your hand. It feels like that dance that all cinematographers know and love, right? And it enables you to build these familiar platforms, whether you're on a 6300, an A7 III, or an A7S III, right? You can, you can transplant those accessories and pretty easily replicate your camera setup and your workflow, no matter what body you're using. And that's why we love using cages. It's a way of really force multiplying the power that your camera has. You take that sensor, you take that starting point, and you turn it into this platform that enables you to create in very different and specific ways, but each a little more powerful than the camera has ability for it just by itself as a body. Probably the most common rig, second to the cage, right, is us putting a camera on a gimbal. And a gimbal is, is this really weird piece of technology where it's, it's almost, it's, it's overused and it's underused, right? I see guys permanently strapping their camera to a gimbal, right? And gimbals have great utility, but there's, I feel as if you do miss that, that language of handheld, right? Gimbals have a very specific time and place, but what a gimbal does do is, even though you've got it in your arms, a gimbal multiplies the power that you have as a single shooter on set. A gimbal enables you to run with your camera. It enables you to dive with your camera, to swoop with your camera, to get shots that you would need to lay tracks for, or have a second hand, or have a steady rig with somebody watching your back, right? We use gimbals not just as like a crutch, right? But really as a creative tool to amplify what you can make on the day, and what is reasonable to ask one crew member creating, and really push what that person can create. Gimbals, of course, will allow you to get your footage a lot smoother. Let's say you're doing a tracking shot. 
gimbals also allow you to get more complicated shots that while they probably could be done handheld, a gimbal allows you to have a bit more safety margins in terms of shakiness on the video, but also repeatability. We love to program little movements into our gimbals that yes, you can do handheld. Let's say you wanna do that classic vortex pull out shot. Um, and I have done those shots handheld. But if you need to do it again and again and again and again, having your finger on a joystick instead of crouching down and moving your whole body enables you as a single shooter to persevere and get that shot you need to do. Something to remember is, is often as single creators, as people who create by themselves, we feel the, the endurance, the sport that is creating, right? I physically feel it in my body when I get a good shot and I know how hard it is to get that good shot. And if you haven't set up your camera in a way that allows you to repeat that shot 20 times, 40 times, again, 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 you're the one getting in the way of an actor's performance or a director's vision because you might end up physically unable to do that shot because you're, you've rigged your camera incorrectly. The next setup I wanna to touch on and something that I love because it, it introduces something that I'm incredibly interested in creatively, this idea of restriction, right? This idea that if you give yourself a specific set of constraints, or you need to create within a certain number of parameters, right? It will make you as a creative far more fruitful and give you a lot more ingenuity in the moment. Something I really struggle with is when I have all of the choice in the world, right? Because then knowing what is the right thing to do is a lot harder because there's all these right things to do. And putting your camera on a slider really, really knuckles down, puts you into that creative lock, right? Where the only thing you can do is go left to right. The only thing you can do is go back and forward, right? And once you've got those constraints, there's a lot you can do creatively from there. We obviously love pairing it with probe lenses or high macro lenses, but you can also pair your slider combo with a wide, right? You need to get an astro time-lapse, right? You need to get a time-lapse of just a general space. And that's why I love sliders, right? They're constrained. They have a very specific visual language. But once you understand how to deploy that language, what it should be used for, you can get infinitely creative and feel a lot more confident about the creative decisions you've made than if you were trying to do the same moves on a gimbal or try to do them handheld. And one thing that a slider has that I've touched on in this video before, infinite repeatability, right? If you have a complex shot that you might need to do over hours or might need to do 20 times in one project, put it on a slider. There's no way that you as a handheld shooter will be able to do that. You can, you can jerry-rig it, right? We know how to put a camera on a towel or a beanbag and slide it across a table. But if you really want that clean repeatability, a slide is what I reach for. The last kind of rig I wanna to touch on, it's kind of a catch-all, right? It's that hyper-specialized rig. It's the rig that is specific for the shot and the one that you could not get the shot without. So one that we've used is an underwater housing for your camera, right? The utility is evident there, right? You take your camera and you can put it underwater. And that's, that's again what I talk about. You're using the same camera, but you're using it in a completely different utility. We've taken our cameras and used them for our surf ad that we did, and we've taken them on diving trips, right? And what that enabled us to do is it enabled us to interact in a space that most commonly is reserved for action cameras, but bring that quality of a full frame camera, of a Sony sensor camera, and use the picture profiles that we've used in the rest of the piece into that shot, right? Something we talk about, something in the language of editing or cinematography is the question, does it match, right? Does it cut? And that's what we try to protect whenever we're creating. And that's why these rigs are so important, right? If you are in the edit, if you're doing a creative project, you want to make that, that 
thing that you're creating as seamless as possible at the end of the day. Sometimes you'll have to use other gear to achieve that, but as much as we can, we endeavor to bring our cameras, whether it's an APS-C camera or a full frame camera, whether it's a dedicated video camera or whether it's just a stills camera that we're trying to get in a spot that is quite inaccessible to you normally, right? And that brings me back to the beginning of the video. My joy at the fact that nowadays when we get a camera launch, we don't get a spec sheet, we get a behind the scenes video. And it touches on the fact that at the end of the day, we're gonna be creating with these cameras. And that's all they are. They are tools, right? They are a starting point that should enable and inform how you're gonna create moving forward. And if you're like us, if you're a small team with big client needs, having a small platform, a smart platform, is a great starting point to then create an even smarter, more agile setup to help you achieve the shots you're trying to emulate.